Lord, I lift your name on high. Will you stand with me and we'll open our service by making use of this. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Welcome on this glorious Lord's Day morning. We welcome you here to Word of Life Chapel. And uh, we have a few announcements I'd like to go over. You may follow along if you desire in your bulletins. Uh, the youth group will meet tonight, 530 to 7.30, dinner being provided. Prayer meeting tonight as well, 530. Uh, choir practice this week on Thursday, 630. Uh, there will be a men's uh, breakfast and work day next Saturday, uh, April 13th. Uh, breakfast beginning at 8 a.m. and then a work day to do mulching and that here at the church. Also, uh, next Sunday, April 14th, is Mission Sunday, and there's more information there uh, in your bulletin about that. And there will be a potluck uh, lunch afterwards, so uh, you please uh, sign up today for that. Um, also, I'd like to draw your attention to the benefit dinner for uh, Melissa and Don. Uh, that's going to be Saturday, April 20th here at the church, 5 to 7 p.m. Um, donations will be used to help cover expenses. Uh, please uh, make checks out. There's information there on how to do that. Uh, Word of Life Chapel benefit dinner. Uh, the uh, menu is there as well. Uh, the deadline to sign up for that is next Sunday, so please uh, be aware of that, and, uh, and uh, that sign up is at the bulletin board, of course, in the uh, fellowship hall. And uh, I think that's all I have this morning. Uh, we'll continue with praise and worship. Check, check. Good morning. How's
How's everybody? All right, I'm all situated now. I'm going to read a verse before we begin worshiping through music, but Psalm 95, 6. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Uh, if you'd all stand with us, we're going to sing Awesome God. Not the verses, just the chorus. our comforter, our father. He's, he's, he's many things. And in different seasons in our life, I think he shows himself in a new way too because he meets us where we're at and he meets our needs. Yeah? All right. Um, what are some ways to worship? 
What was it? By song. What was it? Prayer. Dancing. Yeah. Um, Tim Delina says, worship is obedience. I want to go back to that verse that I read before we sang Awesome God. Psalm 95, 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Often, when we think of worship, when we think of praise, we think of singing, right? That's somewhat Americanized because we can worship through singing. It's biblical, definitely. But it's more than that. Worship is how we live our lives. Worship, worship is obedience, like Tindalina says. It's praise, it's prayer. It's carving out time for our Savior daily. That's worship. Worship is a posture of our hearts. Uh, I saw a quote a couple days ago by Corey Ten Boom. I have learned to hold all things loosely so God will not have to pry them out of my hands. When we have open hands to the Lord, saying, Lord, take my time, take my degree, take the skills, the gifts that you've given me. Bowing before the Lord our Maker. That, that's worship. And not even, we can kneel. We can get, get flat down on the, on the, the uh, carpet here and we could uh, show that posture. But I think more, more so biblically, uh, the posture of our heart. Where, where, where are our hearts at? Where, how, do we, uh, how do we spend our time? How do we pray? Do we carve out that time for the Lord? I'm almost done. And then we'll get on with uh, worshiping through music. All right, this is Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thres thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The first time I read that, I was in Haiti. And my uncle, we were up on a high rise, and we were looking out through Haiti, and there was like fires all over, all over the place. I guess it was somewhat normal for that season. And he said, Brandon, I want to read you something, and I want to... I want you to envision Isaiah's vision here. This is a, a vision from, uh, that God gave Isaiah. So he said, Brent, I want you to envision your Isaiah. You're there. You're looking out. He said, you see that building way out there? I said, yeah. I said, all right, I'm going to read this now. So I want you guys to picture you're on a rooftop, and you're looking out, and you see a building way out in the distance. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the thresh thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. 
And he touched my lips and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Now let me add a little bit more context here. It's a Persian tradition that when a kingdom took over another kingdom, when the Persians took over another empire, they would take the leader's robe and sew it on to their, their robe. Now, I don't know if this is connected, but when I read this, this part here, says, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The train of his robe filled the temple. So our God is over all kingdom, all over, over all kingdoms, over all kings. He is Lord of all. His robe, it's filling a building. That's awesome. <laughs> um, one last passage, for real, and then we shall sing. There's not many descriptions of, of Jesus physically throughout Scripture. One of two. And this may be figurative, but Revelation... One twelve. This is a vision that John had. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. So if you'd stand with me, we can worship that God, the one who's face shines in full strength, the one who is worthy of all of our praise, who is holy, 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 set apart, set apart, set apart. This is you are holy. Oh, so 
declarations in it. I think songs are powerful that declare things, that declare truth. The chorus, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. So let's declare those things together. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Here it is. And I'm no longer asleep to fear. I am a child
Good morning and welcome to Word of Life Chapel Missions Moment. We have three updates we would like to bring to you this morning. First of which is the Vanuatu water project, water pipeline project. As some of you probably know, there was a container slated to leave Friends in Action down in Middletown, Pennsylvania last Friday. It did in fact leave. It has arrived at the port in New York where it awaits the validation of the customs paperwork upon the completion of which it can be loaded onto a container and head to Vanuatu. Anybody know where Vanuatu is? It's a fur piece from here. Uh, if you go to Brisbane, Australia, which is on the northeast corner of Australia, it's about 820 miles out into the water from Brisbane. If you were to fly there, it would be an 8,300 mile trip, which is equivalent to one third of the distance uh, around the circumference of the Earth. It's, uh, for those of us who can't really unpack what an 8,300 mile flight would be like, it's kind of like flying to LA and back to Harrisburg and back to LA and 500 miles back toward Harrisburg. Our container was not able to get a ticket on an airplane, so it's gonna be going on a ship and my understanding is that since the ship can't, has to go around continents, can't go over top of them, it's going to be a significantly longer uh, distance for it to go. And since it will not be flying at 500 miles an hour, the uh, ship goes considerably slower than that, probably 20 mile an hour, probably even less. And so it's gonna take weeks to get there. There are four containers slated to go in this project. Uh, this one, as soon as they can get the validation uh, paperwork, completed and get it loaded. Another one probably in June, another one probably early fall, another one probably late fall. I want to tell you just a little bit about the water project, the water pipeline project in Vanuatu. It is a very ambitious project. Uh, it will be fed from an artesian well that delivers about 77 gallons a minute. It's a 16 mile pipeline that will service 16 communities, each of which will have three or so access points uh, for water to those communities. It will start out as a six inch pipe, later it will be reduced to a four inch pipe, and then later to a three inch pipe. Um, there will be at least one pressure tank, if not more, a uh, pressure reducing tank along the way to help control the pressure. Um, the last I understood, the pipeline itself, the piping itself will be coming from Canada. And they, uh, it was a big enough project already, but the local government, the government does not have the capacity, the wherewithal to rework the road that will, be, have, to, that will have to be used in getting the pipe in place and so forth. So they have asked Friends in Action to do that. So that makes it a bigger yet project. Um, it is the hope and prayer of those engaging in the work of the pipeline that it will bring clean sanitary water for the health and well-being of the bodies of the people of Vanuatu. And their hope and prayer then is that it will be a catalyst and an open door to make them receptive to the living water of God that will be 
provide for the redemption and well-being of their souls. Second update. You have in your bulletins a fly or a page that looks like this. Kathy Ridge has been kind enough to provide the this in a QER format, quite easy to read, uh, complete with pictures. And it is about a young missionary, Hannah Seaton, who recently has been picked up by Word of Life Chapel here for support in our adding our monthly support to her uh, total. She is now at full support. She is a young missionary to Taiwan. She has completed a course by an organ through in a, through an organization in Taiwan called Word of Life. Imagine that. It's an immersion program for Bible training and for language and for discipleship. Hannah will be doing media, uh, assisting with the media needs of the organization. Uh, she will be, one of the first things she's going to encounter when she gets there is a, uh, what they call tomb sweeping. There's, she's going to get a heavy dose of the culture very quickly. Uh, the first project is called a tomb sweeping where the nationals come and they clean off the graves and the tombs of the ancestors and they offer sacrifices to them. Um, as you can imagine, that's a little bit challenging situation for uh, Christians. And then uh, after that, there's a pilgrimage of about 220 miles that 3 million people participate in. And that again is a tr tradition steeped in superstition. And then just recently, there was an earthquake off the coast of Taiwan. So you might pray for that on the 3rd of April. Um, on the back side, there are some praise and some prayer requests. Please read this and uh, pray, please. Pray for the Vanuatu as well. Third, last but not least, you'll see a, a printout like this, also in the QER format. Quite easy to read. Uh, Justin Hollinger, a missionary to Honduras, will be here next Sunday for our Mission Sunday. We plan to start off the morning with a combined Sunday school class in the fellowship hall, adults down through, I think, uh, youth at least. And he will be presenting his ministry there. After that morning worship service, he will spend a handful of minutes here presenting his ministry to the congregation, after which he will go down to junior church. Following the service, a potluck, another opportunity to get to know him a little better. Long about dessert time, we plan to show an eight minute video of one of the containers being prepped and loaded uh, to go to Vanuatu. After that, our own Steve Bordner will do a presentation on his desired trip to go help with the Vanuatu water pipeline project. Immediately following the potluck, there will be time for questions and answers in conversation with both Justin and Steve Bordner. In the evening, uh, next Sunday, Justin will be with prayer meeting. The youth will be with us when prayer meeting is done. Justin is going to go finish up the evening with the youth. Please pray. Thank you for your time, and that is the conclusion of today's missionary moment. Thank you. Well, good morning. Wonderful to see all of you today, this beautiful, sunny morning that we are uh, privileged to be able to gather together and worship our God, our awesome God. Um, I'd like to say a special thank you to Rich and Angie Shoup for decorating specifically over the Easter season. They did a wonderful job I'm on the stage, so I'd like to give them a round of applause. Very thankful for you, very thankful for you and all the work that you do. Also, if you're visiting this morning, there is a connection card in the front of your pew. Uh, love to uh, if you fill that out, I'd love to connect with you, meet you, introduce myself, and spend some time with you. Uh, would you please bow your heads and close your eyes as we continue the service in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. As one body here made up of many members, I pray that we would be unified, rooted, founded on the word of God, the word of truth. I pray that this morning would glorify you, 
Pray for those who are hurting, that you would comfort them, that you would give them peace that surpasses all understanding. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the death, burial, and resurrection. Help us not to forget, but to live our lives rooted in the truth that set us free. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand one more time? We're going to go continue our service with a hymn. Just when I need him, Jesus is near. <clears throat> Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. Ready to help me, ready to cheer. Just when I need him most. Just when I need If you have a copy of God's Word, would you please open to the Gospel of Mark? The Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. Mark 12, verses 13 through 34. I'm only going to read the first several verses to begin with. But before I do that, uh, would you please bow your heads and close your eyes as we look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I come to you in the name of our strong Savior, Jesus Christ, made possible through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of your Son when that veil was torn. What a privilege that is. What a blessing. Thank you for letting me talk to you this morning. I pray that you'd give me the words. That I would decrease 
and you would increase. And I pray that through the proclamation of your word, we would continually change. You deserve everything. May you be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, starting in verse 13. And they sent him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Have you ever heard the phrase, The enemy of my enemy is my friend? It takes me back to when I used to coach basketball, and one of my good friends coached for the rival team. And Whenever we got together during basketball season, we typically didn't, we didn't talk basketball. We didn't want to go there. We didn't want to fight. We didn't want to argue. But there was some times where we, t- we would talk basketball was when one of us was playing that one team that we both didn't like. And so the enemy of my enemy became my friend. And we would often give each other inside information when we played them uh, they did this, or when the coach yells this, they run this play, and, and we would work together to try to defeat a team that we mutually disliked. That's what's kind of happening in the text. The Herodians and the Pharisees are teaming up because they both hate Jesus. I mean, that, that's really what this boils down to. In verse 13, it says, and they sent him some Pharisees and the Herodians to communities that typically didn't like each other. The Pharisees were religiously conservative. They followed the Torah. Uh, The Herodians were religiously liberal. They were open. They were syncretistic, meaning they were open to different belief systems and religions. The Pharisees were, well, they kept their distance from Rome. The Herodians, they supported the Roman government following Herod Antipas, a ruler over Galilee. Typically, these groups would hate each other. But here, they find common interest. Their mutual hatred of Jesus Christ. And so they go up to Jesus. In fact, the text says in verse 13, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians. And you've got to keep in mind, too, this happens directly after the cleansing of the temple. Before that, the triumphal entry when Jesus enters Jerusalem and his fame and popularity is increasing. And so the Pharisees and the Herodians not only find common interest that they hate Jesus, but they hate Jesus because they don't want to lose power. They don't want to give up control. The crowds are following Jesus, and so the Pharisees were threatened. The crowds were following Jesus, so the Herodians were threatened that perhaps Jesus would turn into a rebel or an insurrectionist and try to take over the Roman government. They hate him. And so they ask Jesus a series of questions to trap him. Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they start with this insincere flattery in verse 14. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are true and you 
Do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? They were asking Jesus a question that put him in a lose-lose situation. A coin that they would use to pay their taxes was called a denarius, the size of a, a U.S. dime. And on the front of it would have a picture of Tiberius, Caesar Augustus. And it would say, Tiberius, Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. And on the back of the coin, it would say Pontifex Maximus, which means high priest. So this coin that was used to pay taxes referred to the Roman rule as gods, demigods, the high priest of the nation. And so if Jesus said yes to this question, you should pay your taxes, he would be accused of not being faithful to God. And they were planning to use this to discredit Jesus. Well, you're basically breaking the second commandment, no graven images, no God before me, and you're saying pay taxes to a ruler that claims to be God, affirming his deity. On the flip side of the coin, if Jesus said, no, you shouldn't pay your taxes, well, then the Pharisees uh, would say, or the, the Herodians would, would, that would affirm their claim that Jesus was a rebel, a renegade, that perhaps he was going to start an insurrection and they would arrest him for treason. And so they put Jesus in a lose-lose situation. Why? Because they hated him and they wanted to kill him. And whatever he was going to answer, yes or no, they were going to use. I mean, the ill-intended question. What they didn't expect is Jesus' response. Verse 15. But knowing their hypocrisy, he knew they were hypocrites. He knew that their flattery was insincere when they started out saying, Jesus, you know everything and I mean, you teach the truth. I mean, they didn't mean it. Jesus, knowing that they were hypocrites in his omniscience and his sovereignty, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. Verse 16, and they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's. They were expecting a yes or a no answer. And Jesus unexpectedly goes above and beyond and answers their question in a way that leaves them speechless. The end of verse 17, they marveled at him. They couldn't even say anything. Jesus says, go get me a, a coin, a denarius, knowing that Tiberius Caesar Augustus image was on the front and on the back it said Pontifex Maximus, the high priest. He said to them, whose image is on that coin? And they responded, Caesar's. Jesus said, render to Caesar's. In other words, that coin has Caesar's face on it. It belongs to him. It has his image on it. But those who have the image of God belong to God. That wasn't the only question they used to trap Jesus, and ultimately they, they failed. They couldn't outsmart Jesus. <laughs> you can't outsmart him either. But they're going to try again. Not only do they send the, the Pharisees and the Herodians to trap Jesus, or entangle Jesus. The Sadducees come along in verse 18. And the Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher of Moses wrote for us that a man, if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, 
but leaves no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring, and the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. Now, there are differences between Sadducees and Pharisees. The Sadducees dealt primarily with the affairs of the temple. But two of the the main distinctions between a Pharisee and a Sadducee is that the Pharisee believed in the afterlife, in the resurrection. While the Sadducee in this text indicates for us in verse 18, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And the book of Acts chapter 23 tells us that the Sadducees didn't believe in angels either. They didn't believe in the spirit realm. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in eschatology. They didn't, they didn't believe in any of that while the Pharisees did. They most likely were called annihilationists. Have you ever heard that before? Basically, the idea is when you die, you die. There's nothing after death. You're annihilated. And they also held strictly to the Torah, or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they followed them strictly, which led them to believe there was no resurrection because they didn't believe in any other books of the Bible or they didn't believe in the oral law that would be passed down or the stories. They just believed in those first five books and that's what they taught and that's what they believed. They didn't believe in anything else. And so they try to trap Jesus. Disagreeing with the Pharisees, but nonetheless, they're trying to trap Jesus. Asking him a question specific to the resurrection. Referring back to Deuteronomy chapter 25, a law uh, that was used provisionally to protect the rights of women. Uh, When a woman lost her husband, It was custom for the brother to take her as a wife and take care of her. In that culture, women couldn't take care of themselves like you do today. You couldn't really get a job. You relied on your husband. And so the Old Testament law made a provision. I mean, that's what happened. Uh, And they made this, this law or this custom that if you lost your husband, his brother was to take you as his wife. And so they ask him this crazy question and give him this ridiculous scenario. And some scholars believe this was like a fiction story at the time that they just kind of threw out there to Jesus and said, well, you know, if you, this, this woman basically keeps losing her husbands, seven husbands later, and, and she dies, what in the world is going to happen in heaven? I mean, who, who is she going to be married to? knowing that they don't even really believe in the resurrection. I mean, this is a, what I call a gotcha question. I mean, they're trying to trip Jesus up. I mean, it, it doesn't even make sense. It's, it's a fallacy, right? It's faulty reasoning. And this happens today. People get into theological debates. I mean, you ask a question, but you're not really asking a question. It's a straw man argument, right? You're building something up just to knock it down later and improve your point. I and mean, that's what they're trying to do asking this obscure question about the resurrection, thinking that they could trip Jesus up, trap him, and entangle him. But again, they could not trick Jesus in his omniscience, in his sovereignty, in his deity. Verse 24, Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead but of the living. You are quite wrong. Jesus shed some light 
know what heaven will be like one day. There will be no marriage. I'm going to suggest to you that's not really going to matter to you very much when you're in the presence of the Lord. There's no more pain. There's no more suffering. The book of Revelation chapter 21 tells us all things will be made new. And Jesus, being God, <laughs> tells them what the future is really going to look like. But then he proves them wrong using Scripture, pointing them back to the Torah they were dedicated to following. He takes them all the way back to the book of Exodus when God meets Moses, the burning bush experience. And one of the things that God said to Moses to encourage him in all those I am statements, he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Referencing Moses back to the covenants that he made with the patriarchs of Scripture. And what God doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, they may have physically died, but they are still living. So Jesus points out a serious, ginormous flaw in their argument, going back to the Torah that they so literally exegeted, proving them wrong. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. And the Bible doesn't reference a rebuttal. Uh, similar to the Pharisees and the Herodians, marvel, don't say anything. Well, this trick question, this fallacy that they asked Jesus, so they don't really have an answer for the, the answer of Jesus either because they were wrong. It's almost like a chess game. I love the game of chess. I usually lose. But if you ever play chess with somebody who's really good, like really good, every so often when you're playing chess, you think to yourself, man, I really got a good move here. And you make the move, and you're like, maybe this is the time, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat them. Right? I'm gonna... Only for them to know that you were going to do that like three moves ago and checkmate you in three moves anyway. Dale Warner does it to me all the time. That's what's kind of happening here. They're asking Jesus these questions, and they're, they're playing chess with him, but they don't realize they're playing chess against the grandmaster. They're playing chess against the chess maker <laughs> who knows everything who knew that they were going to ask those questions before they even asked them. And Jesus, again, proves them wrong. Not because he's not going to die. I mean, at the end of the day, Jesus predicts three times in the Gospel of Mark that they were going to kill him. But it wasn't his time quite yet. And so he's teaching. He's answering. He's clearing up some confusion. Not only did the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, ask Jesus questions about taxes and the resurrection, but they also asked Jesus questions about the commandments, sending a scribe. The scribe was the member of the Sanhedrin who was the scholar of the group who would translate and, and work through historic religious documents. And so he comes in verse 28, and one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, to love one's neighbor as one's self is much more, all of whole burnt offerings and sacrifices." And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said, to him, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more 
questions. So the scribe asks him a question about the law, an academic question. What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds, summarizing all of the old law into two commands. Love God and love others. Loving God with all of your heart, your soul, with your mind and all your strength, every facet of your being, loving God. And that really does summarize most of the Old Testament. If you think about the Ten Commandments, no other gods before me, no graven images, keep the Sabbath holy. All of it stems from a place of loving God. And that's what we are called to do as well. Love God with every fiber, facet of our being, fully dedicated to the worship and glorification of our great and awesome God. That's not the only commandment that Jesus states. The other is to love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. You think about the Ten Commandments. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't bear false witness. Yeah, it's about other people. It's about loving others. And so Jesus tells this guy, responds to him. He's most likely trying to trick him to. Two greatest commandments. Love God and love others. And the scribe has a, a different response. While the Pharisees, Herodians, and Sadducees really didn't say anything, the scribe concurs with them. He agrees with Jesus' response. Verse 32, And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. To love him with all your heart and with all your un the understanding and with all your strength, to love neighbors as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. I mean, this does verify what the Old Testament teaches anyway in the book of Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3, to do righteous and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15, 22, Samuel said, has the Lord has a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. That's kind of what the old law taught all along. That following the commandments isn't loving God. We love God, therefore we follow the commandments of God. It stems from a, of a healthy love and fear of God Almighty. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus responds back to him something kind of sad. You are not far from the kingdom of God. It's interesting. The scribe is close and yet so far. He's close because he does agree with Scripture. but he doesn't fully submit to the messiahship of Jesus Christ. So he's on the right track, but he's still far away from the kingdom of God. It takes us back to verse 24, which is really the heart of this passage. When Jesus corrects the Sadducees' line of thinking, and he said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither scriptures nor the power of God. That's what led all of them to think poorly, to be mistaken, misunderstood about who Jesus was in the first place was because they didn't truly know the Scripture and believe in the power of God. That's why this scribe is close, but he's still far away because he's not submitting 
to God 100% fully. That's really what the heart of this whole thing is. That's what the big idea is this morning. The kingdom of God is encountered by those who know Scripture and the power of God. Those are the true Christ followers. The Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, the scribes. They're not the true Christ followers in this text. Why? Because they don't know Scripture. Clearly, they're mistaken about the resurrection. They're mistaken about taxes, commandments. When we dive in and we drill down the heart of this text, the kingdom of God is encountered by those who know Scripture and believe in the power of God. I do have a couple takeaways for you this morning before we conclude. Number one, pay your taxes. <laughs> wow. Pay your taxes, you know? It's something we all know and love, taxes, right? Wasn't it Ben Franklin that once said, you know, two things in life are certain, death and taxes, right? But yeah, I, I think that actually that is a, a real-life application here. Uh, I'm saying that in jest, but I'm actually kind of serious. I mean, Jesus does tell us to honor our government and to pay our taxes, right? Last time I checked you, I don't have any money, um, or else I'd show you. Uh, but, uh, you know, you take out a dollar bill, it doesn't have my face on it. Doesn't have God's faith. Well, it does say in God we trust. That's a, that's a sermon for another day. Um, it has somebody else's face on it. First Timothy chapter 1, we should pray for our, our government leaders. First Peter, we should honor the emperor supreme. That is a, an application here that Jesus is making that, you know, we're placed under the authority. Romans chapter 13 the God-given authority in our lives. And we're really called to submit to our government unless they call us to do something that directly goes against the word of God. But when I say pay your taxes, I, I just don't mean pay your earthly taxes. I mean pay your spiritual tax. If you go back to the book of Genesis chapter 1 with me, verse 26 and 27 Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We are image bearers. Like the coin, they held up to Jesus and he said, whose image is on that? They said, Caesar's. Well, you should probably give that to Caesar. If I were to hold one of you up, you know, whose image is on you? God's image is on you. Pay your taxes. We're all made in the image of God and we are called to fully, I mean, it really goes back, this whole thing runs together. That's why I preach these things together sometimes. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and with your mind and your strength. Everything that you are and everything that you have belongs to God. Why? Because if I were to hold you up, whose image is on you? God's image is on you. Pay your taxes. Give your life fully to God. The second takeaway, two Greek words. Exegete, don't eisegete. What in the world does that mean? Well, I think they're actually helpful words for us. They're hermeneutics. Everybody say hermeneutics. That wasn't very loud. <laughs> Usually I have some pretty good participation in here. I know it's 11.13. We're getting close to lunch. But everybody say hermeneutics. That was much better. Well, hermeneutics... It means Bible study. A set of principles that you follow when you study the Bible. And it's really important to exegete. And the Greek word means to draw out or extract. And not eisegete, which means to read into. Let me explain. Right here in the text, the Sadducees eisegete Scripture. 
they're reading into. They already believed that there was no resurrection, and so they go back and they find this obscure passage in Deuteronomy to back up what they already believed. That's eisegesis. And that happens a lot, actually, when people study the Bible. We go to the Bible with what we want it to say, and we find Bible verses to kind of back up what we want it to say. Instead, we shouldn't do what the Sadducees did. We should exegete. We should go to Scripture with a fresh lens and draw meaning out of it. Studying the Word of God the way it was intended to be studied. Drilling down into the context of what's actually happening right here. Reading it carefully. Considering the immediate context, such as the cleansing of the temple that happened right before this. Considering the larger context of the book of Mark, which primarily is about discipleship. Considering the Bible. How does this scripture fit into the overarching redemptive story of grace? But you can see where this can quickly happen in our lives. Like the Sadducees, we, we believe things. It's partially true, and we can even use Bible verses to back up and take things out of context. That's eisegesis. And it leads people down dark paths where they don't really know Scripture. Like the scribe. Kind of know Scripture, but... Eh. Instead, we draw meaning out of the text. And that's Mark chapter 12. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Trying to trip Jesus up and failing. Because Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He is God. He's omniscient. And he's sovereign. I encourage you. Know scripture and believe in God. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's rich. We thank you that it's alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. I pray that you would bless the rest of our time together. May our fellowship be sweet. And may you be forever glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. We close with making use of hymn number 483 if you're using the hymn book. We have a story to tell to the nations, and I pray that each one of us might have something to take with us today that we might be able to help others to that might not have heard the word this morning to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Shall we stand as we sing? We have a story to tell the nation to the nations. We're going to sing the first, the third, and the fourth verse. We have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right, a story of truth and mercy, a story. Dawning to noonday bright, and 
Do you join me in a word of corporate prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever. Amen. Pay your taxes. <laughs> oh.